Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm Dr. Amy Harway. And I'm Mo. I'm Sin. And you're watching The, the Sex, Sex Talk. Talk. talk and today I thought we'd talk about sobriety mm -hmm. in sex and dating yeah I think sober dating and sober sex is an interesting concept because people who have drank heavy before or even just casual or social drinkers might be really used to first dates having those couple drinks and when they sit and think about it hmm, when was the last time that I had sex or went on a first date without any substance at all and maybe that's not even alcohol maybe that's cannabis especially with legalization of cannabis in California and other places so it's really common for people to smoke to drink or to use drugs date with around dating and sexuality but what happens when that's not present anymore what about that change from non sober to sober dating and sexuality and what is totally sober life like when you date and have sex so yeah. I think that's something that we should talk about <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually yeah I, I was just talking to sin about that because sin has never actually had a drink never Never drank, never smoked, never done any drugs. Okay. Wow. Nothing. That's amazing. Yeah. And so we live in such a medicated society. Like even if you're not drinking a lot, you're even if you're not smoking weed a lot, there's psychotropic medications that people are taking. There's anxiety medications. There's medications for ADHD. All of which sort of alter us and, you know, alter us emotionally, alter us mentally, physically sometimes. And so even, t you know, even taking those away can really... Um, make sexuality and dating different, mm -hmm. um, sometimes harder. So I wanted to, you know, sort of talk about that. But this is very interesting because you've never, ever, never, even sort of masked any of that. Mm -hmm. So all of your experiences always have been sober dating and sober sexual experiences. Completely, yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, you know, I've dated some people in the past that, um, or most of the people. Let me just let me say, most of the people that I did date in the past were sober or uh not heavy drinkers or, or mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. uh definitely not like um heavy drug users or, or anything like that right because um, right. i think it's it, I, don't, I don't think it's very common for someone you know to have never touched it's anything, not it's, it's not you know? i so, feel like in our society it's definitely not yeah, common. yeah so it was um for me you know going into relationships you know i would always tell them obviously you know hey i've been sober my whole life um mm -hmm. i don't uh, have a problem with people drinking or you know doing whatever they want to do as long as it doesn't turn into a problem right for me right um, right. like I, to me you know um, there have been a couple that have slipped in through the cracks there where mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know would have they would say oh you know I don't do this or I don't do that and then slowly it would come out that Mm -hmm. They did, and then you know mm -hmm. I'm carrying someone out of a club, and oh. you know so it would get like it would get it would and, and uh -huh. stuff like that. Like I'm not one to I don't want to babysit you know yeah. someone. Um, so unless it turns into a problem, I mean I don't have an issue with mm -hmm. it per se. Right. It's just something I've never done, um, and it's mm -hmm. worked well for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know. I mean everybody has their own preference, and one thing I really learned a lot when I was working under Mo many years ago, um, I had gotten sober about seven years ago and I think just maybe my own projections my own experiences when people or clients I had brought up that they had used heavy drugs my own response came up inside and as a therapist you typically work through what that feels like for you and I remember it was you that told me you know what like don't drug shame people if it's not a problem people are going to choose what they're going to choose and your job isn't to judge or to instruct but maybe just to sit there with them and unless it's a problem and they're looking for help with that or it's a problematic behavior people are going to choose to do what they're going to do. So pretty much as a therapist and with my friends, I look at it more as risk reduction or harm reduction um, mm -hmm. support with my friends or my clients. As far as dating goes, I've been sober seven years, so I'm not going to take that role with a partner, right. um, but I take that role as a therapist and with my friends as, you know, what's going to be the most responsible usage of these things. Mm -hmm. But for dating, um, when you're using, there's a few different ways that we can look at that. I got a question one time when I used to write a Q&A and it was, well, what does it mean when somebody can't have sex without cannabis? Well, that means you're dependent on cannabis to have sex and that's probably a problematic thing if you need a thing, whatever that thing might be, mm -hmm. to engage intimately. Mm -hmm. However, people can use things recreationally like alcohol or cannabis to enhance or 
add other types of feelings to a sexual situation. Mm -hmm. However, you're you are not fully, fully present in that moment. So it's just a choice right. to have a different experience, sensory experience of that moment. When you don't have any substance, you are just fully in yourself at that time. Right. And for some people that can be intimidating or scary. So sober dating or sober sex for the first time for somebody who's typically even had a couple mm -hmm. drinks on dates can feel very intimidating. Right, and people who go through recovery that have had some sort of drinking problem or have wanted to reduce their drinking or drug use and then they go back into dating or they go back into their sex life, they oftentimes, I've, which I've seen a lot in, in my office is when they sort of remove the alcohol or the drug from their life, their sexuality kind of goes with it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do we reintegrate my sexuality or my dating life back into my life? Because a lot of times, alcohol and drugs in our society go along with this sort of like inability to be comfortable around sex mm -hmm. and dating. So you know, let's have a drink to loosen up. I mean, that's our culture. Everyone's even on a date. Well, yeah. don't you want a date? Well, don't you want a drink? Yeah. Or let's meet at a bar. Yeah, we'll a bar everything and we'll is up. and at bars, they're mm -hmm. all about hooking up and they're all about drinking because that is kind of what is perpetuated mm -hmm. in our society and it's it's acceptable. It's mm -hmm. it's allowed, but then when it becomes a problem, people have to remove the drugs and alcohol from their life and sort of inevitably their sexuality and their you know their dating and their relationships kind of also kind of well they change they, it's they going to look to. sober dating is going to look different especially for somebody that was dependent or reliant on a substance it's just going to look and feel very different and at first what i find with clients that i work with and people i know is that um when they start making that transition it can be scary it might be triggering it might bring up mm -hmm. things that help them realize why they wanted a level of intoxication or a substance to be intimate or to date um, because it brings up some really intimidating, vulnerable moments. Um, I find that being sober and dating and sober in sexuality, it feels a lot more vulnerable. Right. Yeah. Right. I agree with that. I, I mean, I think that um, ultimately, if you're getting that, you know, fucked up, mm -hmm. I think it's covering, it's trying to cover something mm -hmm. up, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's nothing wrong, like I said, um, I've been with many people that, you know, drank and would have mm -hmm. a couple drinks and mm -hmm. it's great, you know, whatever they would make them feel comfortable right. um, mm -hmm. at times. But I think when someone gets to the point where, you know, they're barely coherent, I mean, that, that's just, yeah. uh, to me, that's just, that's a sign that they're clearly trying to cover mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. up that's mm -hmm. deep down. Yeah. You know? yeah. But they need a substance to connect. Yeah. And, you know, I think when we talk about sobriety or we're talking about sober dating, I think our first thought is going to alcohol or, you know, like I said, cannabis. Um, but there are a lot of drugs that also create like a, a sense of connectivity that sometimes people mm. seek out because they want that more than they're able to definitely like, connect on their own, like um, MDMA, ecstasy, even uh, psychedelics that are mm -hmm. sometimes used in a therapeutic mm -hmm. sense now if it's supervised and you know there's a lot of controversy and also debate about about that right now. It's a really hot, hot topic, um, and still it would be something you introduce to engage in something that gives the illusion or feels more connected when maybe you aren't able to or maybe aren't comfortable with the way that you do it without. So I think if you choose to engage in any type of substance in a safe, responsible way, and that's your choice, also being able to explore sexuality without a substance is really important. Yeah, yeah. it's good to be able to do both, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, I, I, I like to say that there's no harm, like, you know, as we were talking about, in using a little bit of cannabis, you know, to have some fun or to let loose mm -hmm. or, even have spiritual experiences with psychedelics or MDMA or whatever, however you choose to, but are you constantly using it? And then, then it becomes problematic behavior. Or if you're using it to avoid a feeling of vulnerability. Yeah. So any type of substance that is, yeah. you're using it to, in terms of dating and sexuality, using it to escape or because vulnerability is just too much for you, right. or you've had a traumatic experience, some of these things will mask those feelings and it won't actually make it better, it just allows you to avoid more and the problem kind of gets bigger. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, as long as you're using those things infrequently in an appropriate dosage, in a responsible way, and that's different for each type of substance, whether it's being supervised or whatever it is, having a responsible party. I know there's um, organizations now that I've heard of that go to Burning Man and other places that will have sober persons sit with you when you use a psychedelic. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely ways to be more or less responsible if you choose to engage in something. Again, there's always a risk, you know, right. when you right. don't control your environment around you. Um, but if you're using it all the time for dating or sexuality, 
it can be problematic. Um, like you said, our culture is kind of based around using substance with dating. Mm -hmm. um, grabbing a drink is usually mm -hmm. the first date that people yeah. have. And when you yeah. don't do that, I know I found being sober and people say, you want to get a drink? I said, well, I, you know, I did mention to you that I don't drink. And they just get thrown off like a robot that can't compute. Well, wait, what, what do yeah. we do? How does that, yeah, oh. how does that work? How, how do you date? Yeah. I know that. <laughs> like, well, so, and so I guess well. my, my question for the two of you is, do you prefer to date people that are also sober? Do you have, do you make, you know, sort of allowances? Well, then you're cutting out a lot of people if you say, I'm only going to date a sober person. But right. you're cutting sure. out a large amount of the population and people fluctuate in and out of sobriety. And for different reasons. That's true. And sober uh -huh. looks different for different people. Mm -hmm. So I know for me, that's definitely not a requirement or something that I have to have. But I have found that when I'm in a partnership or when I'm dating somebody that also doesn't drink or engage in those things, it's not even a question if we're going to go to a bar. Yeah. It's not even a question if we have alcohol in the house. So they just don't. And that's just one less thing to discuss. Right. So it's a little right. easier. It's like preference. preference. Yeah. It's like if you're a vegan, yeah. you're going to want to date a vegan maybe. Sure. Or to see, you can, yeah, you are, are you going to go to probably the same restaurants? So yeah. it right. just right. eliminates it some It just of the, feels like yeah. something that maybe would maybe not be a requirement, but would make life a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, it's it's never been a realistic thing for me to, to expect someone, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to have never tried a drink or never like done anything, right. you know what I mean? Right. It's just not realistic, so I get that. And a lot of um, people are also in AA, so if you're in the yeah. program, one of the recommendations in a 12-step program is not to date for about a year because as you're newly sober, yeah. making choices like that can be difficult and not always positive, which right. is hard not to date at all for a year. So if you're in the program for a year, your first year you're not supposed to date. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also people have different experiences with 12-step programs and sobriety looks different for different people, mm -hmm. whether or not they act out in different ways and have other compulsions. So, you know, I think with sober dating, you definitely have an increased vulnerability. I recommend most clients, like if they don't know if they have a problem with sobriety or with they alcohol, try it. Yeah, right, just like, why not, why not just not drink for 30 days, see how it feels, yeah. you know, just throw it up casually. And most people have found that when it is a problematic behavior and they haven't accepted that, mm -hmm. that 30 days feels really uncomfortable. Oh yeah. yeah. Make it. More than they <laughs> thought and then they think, hey, yeah. maybe I should keep yeah. this going. Yeah. And typically, um, typically I've never heard a negative thing from a person, a client, a friend saying, that they were going to abstain mm -hmm. um, because they enjoy the feeling of being sober or they realize right. that maybe they were dependent in some way on the feeling of um, just not worrying as much when they're when they're drinking or engaging in a substance. Right. Yeah. You definitely have the opportunity to have more mindful, connected sex mm -hmm. when you're sober, mm -hmm. um, mindful, more connected connections with people during dating. Um, I think that you are more likely to make more deliberate choices when you're sober. Um, and I just think that like you don't you don't have to be sober to be able to have those that in your life, mm -hmm. right? You can you can choose to have a drink or you can choose to you know engage in in, in drug use or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I would, you know I would highly recommend to balance it out because that mindfulness in dating and sex, is is where all the joy is at mm -hmm. you know and you're missing out on a lot of that if you're constantly sort of intoxicated or under the influence and in our culture now that's so comfortable with dating apps that are all swipe based it's very much there's quantity not quality you're swiping through people like it's a game mm -hmm. uh, typically you meet at a bar you have a drink and a lot of times people are just hooking up a lot faster yeah. because of the accessibility of so many people whether that's because they just feel like they're ready to hook up or a lot of times i hear people saying well, I know there's so much competition because there's so many people on the dating apps that I want to show that I'm able to be sexual and maybe I wouldn't do that otherwise. So our culture is with the dating apps kind of promoting lots of people, maybe less meaningful connections, meeting for alcohol, hooking up quickly. And that's fine if that's what you want to do, but that's not always what feels right for people. So I think the engaging in a substance on first dates can make it easier to slip into behaviors that you feel pressured to do. Um, so I would recommend, especially on a first date, to abstain mm -hmm. or to be more mindful and as I much think, as possible. I think, you know, with the, with our culture the way it is now, with so much available at our mm -hmm. fingertips, that in and of itself can be anxiety provoking. Mm -hmm. Like getting in touch with those emotions, like what is, what is the emotion that's sort of driving you to want to drink tonight? Mm -hmm. You know, what is the emotion that's driving you to want to like, do some drugs, you know. What's the function? What's the yeah, purpose? Yeah, what is it? Because I think that it is really anxiety provoking to date. Mm -hmm. Sex can be very anxiety provoking because it's something that we're just not allowed to talk about on a regular basis, mm -hmm. hence the sex talk. 
you know and so like when we're thrust into a world which doesn't feel safe for us it's easy to want to want to pull on some sort of a crutch and I think that alcohol has sort of been given to us mm -hmm. as like a socially acceptable crutch to use mm -hmm. you know it's so, not, I mean it's it, I, I very much agree with um, the vulnerability of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being sober and doing any of this stuff mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah because you're really out there with nothing well you know everything I mean? you're yeah like, i mean you're like yeah. naked yeah. even when you when you go on stage you know i know musicians that feel like they have yeah. to drink before they go on yeah. stage because it's oh, yeah. so intimidating yeah. and you haven't had that experience like mm -hmm. you're just out there i know yeah. a lot i mean I, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people in bands mm -hmm. that cannot walk out on stage without without the substance yeah. or some type. Yeah. 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 Because it should be called sober sex, dating and stage performance. Yeah. <laughs> <Everything. laughs> performance, anything Everything. where you're in front of other people. I mean this goes back to showing up as yourself in mm -hmm. front of people or peoples yeah. um, as your authentic self and whether yeah. that's on a stage, sexually, yeah. naked, yeah. dating, mm -hmm. because that's all a feeling of vulnerability yeah. because you're showing up as you in front of something or someone. And what do you need to do to be able to do that and what kind of work needs to be done around mm -hmm. it? I mean, Sin never did any work around it or maybe you've just constantly been doing work around it. Mm -hmm. You know, and Amy recently started doing mm -hmm. work around it and, and just sort of getting to the core of, of that can actually be really liberating and enlightening, you know? You know what's funny is, is for many years I never admitted that I was mm -hmm. sober because early mm -hmm. on in my career, when I would talk about it, people would talk down to me. Oh. Um, when a community where people want yeah. to feel safer because you're also using, right? Yeah. right. You I might so like, feel threatening. Yeah, in like those right. like early, early interviews, people would, uh, the backlash I would get would be like, and, and I'm, I hate using this term because I'm not a rock star, but people would say, oh, you're not a real rock star, you don't, you don't drink. Mm -hmm. you, right. you, yeah, but you you're alive this. now. You know, so. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so early on, I stopped talking about it. Mm -hmm. And for many years, like I would just kind of dance around that mm -hmm. subject and that yeah. question. Yeah. And it's not up until, like I want to say in the last five years or so, that I kind of just started Openly Being talking about it. Yeah, yeah, that that yeah. because and, and you know why is um, there have been a couple instances where I've met um, some fans on the road with their kids mm -hmm. and um, I remember this one guy in particular uh, back east brought his, his son was like ten years old and he was like my son's such a big fan of yours he's like and he reads all your interviews and he says that he wants to be just like you he's not going to drink and he's not going to do any drugs Aww, and he's not going to like and he's like and he's taking guitar lessons and I'm like. Wow, like that really kind of hit me. Uh -huh. Like that really hit me. I'm like, wow, you know, by me talking about that, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of, you know, mm -hmm. sort of leading yeah. this kid now. The visibility. To that. Yeah, being you know? visible, especially when you have a platform. I was just going to say, having a platform and using it for good, like yeah. being you and showing up as you and authentic mm -hmm. is, yeah. is. I mean, and just, you know, to me, that was. That was a big thing for me to hear, and and why I started openly talking about mm -hmm. me being, you know, mm -hmm. sober my entire life. Um, you know, everyone again, everyone needs to do what what they want to do. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not. I never tell anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, don't do this, don't do that. This has just worked for me, mm -hmm. um, and it's just to show that you can do what I do mm -hmm. and be completely sober yeah. and still it's have possible. a career. It's possible. Yeah. It's very possible yeah. to do this and yeah. it's possible to be, you know, a perceivingly like wild musician and, you know, go on stage with this type of music and also be sober. So it's yeah. not the this or that, but it's you can be this and that. You can exactly. be yeah. you yeah. can have fun, you can be sexual, you can engage in different lifestyles and choose or not choose to engage yeah. in the substance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a very important yeah. message. Yeah. yeah, and very, I mean, I, I also want to say, I think it's very important that just people, you know, that do drink um, or do whatever, just, you know, just be careful and just try to, you know, not let it get so out of control that you don't even know where you are, what you're doing, where, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many things that can happen. And risk reduction, people, like if you're yeah. going to engage, do it yeah. the way that's the safest and most it's, responsible it's just, for you. Yeah. And try to take those precautions. Exactly. Um, if you're going to engage. Yeah. 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 Like getting a babysitter at Burning Man. If you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's companies that do this. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's, there's a whole nonprofit. That's what I'm doing. It's called Burning babysitter. Sin. Yeah. <laughs> burning <laughs> Sin. I'm sure a lot of people would like your service. <laughs> yeah. I have a trailer set up there. Yeah. Be there next year. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you at Burning Man. Yes. Yeah. The sober sin. No, what is it? Burning sin. Burning sin. sin. Burning sober sin. Sober sin. <laughs> the sober oh, sin yeah. tent. I'll be at the Burning Sin booth. Yeah. <laughs> 
And I think that was... That's the sex talk. <laughs>